Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. Fine, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this Monday. Wow, another week. Another week. Thanksgiving this week, folks. But anyway, it's the 20th of November, 2017, and we're going to continue. And today we are in Rome. Yes, we are. Rome, Italy, the belly of the beast. And I have Leo Zagami on the line with me. And boy, do we have some stories to talk about. But first, let me tell you something. Leo and I have been talking about the Vatican-led New World Order and Satanism and the oncoming uh, wars that they're planning for more than a decade. And I think people now see what we've talked about, Leo, 10 years ago is actually coming true because there is so much decadence and sexual depravity going on in the news, coming out of the Vatican, Hollywood, what have you, that... Uh, people just are starting to go, what is really going on? Maybe these guys were right. Look at, we got wars on one hand. We got a black plague starting out in Africa now. It seems to be that it's coming at us from every angle. But you have some really great information from, from Rome. You've been there for years, and you know the Vatican is behind a lot of this, correct? Absolutely. Hello to all your listeners, and uh, thank you for having me back once again. Uh, it's been 11 years since we started this epic adventure, and uh, talking together has been very constructive, I think, for both your listeners and also for myself to know that there were people out there that uh, wanted to know these stories. Nowadays, it seems, uh, though, they are spreading out even on the mainstream news, and the latest scandal we will talk about today is pretty big news here in Italy, but it's still unheard in international media. What's that, Leo? Uh, as, I was, as I was saying, uh, uh, the latest news I have to give you is basically breaking news all over the Italian media, but it's still not touched at all by the international media, because it is regarding the altar boys of Pope Francis himself. So, wow. Go ahead, tell us. Well, I mean, uh, this, uh, this story sounds uh, rather incredible, but uh, uh, initially uh, it's been, uh, there has been a book coming out by a guy who is a famous investigative journalist called Gianluigi Nuzzi. He made basically this book uh, denouncing certain things. He has some, of course, inside information, but uh, later on uh, he... Uh, basically helped the journalist from one of Berlusconi's channels, Italia Uno, who worked for this TV show called Le Iene, to interview some of these altar boys who allegedly had been raped uh, inside uh, the Vatican walls. And what came out uh, it was shocking, because basically uh, they, they brought out uh, the, the, one of, I think, the biggest scandals of recent years, uh, uh, right in front of everybody using, uh, of course, the media of TV, which in Italy is still very popular, much more popular than the Internet, as you can imagine, Italy is still a bit backwards. So, to actually have uh, this kind of news about alter boys being uh, raped within the Vatican was uh, has been shocking. But the interview with these alter boys is even more shocking, because their accounts uh, are truly chilling. At one point, uh, one of them... Uh, states that sex was going on during the Holy Mass of the Pope uh, right in St. Peter's Basilica. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me, but go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, I know, we, we have been uh, saying this thing for so many years, Greg, and people really accused us of being conspiracy nuts, of being totally out there. I was locked up uh, also several times, persecuted in every possible way. But uh, now these things are coming out in the light of the day because, of course, uh, uh, these are uh, seminarians who uh, worked, uh, well, served, because you are not working, you are serving, of course, they are not paying you to be an altar boy. There is uh, this uh, pre-seminary inside the Vatican walls, 200 meters from where the Pope actually resides. 
where <laughs> every night these uh, altar boys got raped. And uh, some of them got raped and others instead assisted without saying anything because of fear of uh, retaliation. It's a bit like we are, we are seeing uh, on a different, of course, on a different level with different kind of people, what's happening also in Hollywood. We have also been denouncing, uh, I e even wrote a book about uh, Hollywood uh, uh, that was published in Italy three years ago, and also I have denounced with you many times the fact that uh, there is a whole pedophile ring that runs from the Vatican to England, the Royal House, all the way to Hollywood, uh, going through the White House and so on. Now with uh, Donald J. Trump being in charge, of course, uh, things are really changing because we see a lot of arrests in human trafficking, especially in the last period. And now in the Vatican, this uh, bomb uh, really explodes uh, that puts uh, in severe crisis the whole Catholic Church. Because here, uh, Greg, uh, this is not uh, some uh, altar boys serving in a remote church in the province of somewhere in the world. Here we are talking about altar boys that uh, were serving to the Pope. There is images that were shown on TV of these people of course, they covered with some of, you know, like graphic uh, faces to not make them recognizable. But they showed these uh, altar boys while they were serving mass for Pope Francis, while they were shaking the hand of Ratzinger. And yeah. they talked about the relationship with the popes. But what's happening here is that when they went to denounce, because you see, some of the violence was actually inflicted by older seminarians especially a, a specific one that then later became priest and is now actually serving and has even an oratory with little boys. But the, 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 the crazy thing is that there is this, uh, they call it press seminary, because you see, when you become an altar boy in the Vatican, not necessarily you are taking uh, the classic seminarian course that brings you to priesthood. Some of them just do it as an experience. And this should be the place where, as you can imagine, Greg, you know, the families send their kids with great honor for their kids, but also because they think that they will be protected from abuses and things like that. <laughs> In 1956, they opened this pre-seminary uh, dedicated to a pope, which is St. Pius X, which, as you know, gave also the name to another... Uh, fraternity, the, the, the Lefrevians, but this has nothing to do with the Lefrevians. This is actually a pre-seminary based inside the Vatican walls, dedicated to St. Pius X. And uh, this was founded in 1956 by uh, Giovanni Folci, Father Giovanni Folci, who was himself a suspected pedophile priest of the Diocese of Como in Italy. But is now on his way to sainthood. Mm. I think he's a beat or something else. And he founded this association of like-minded priests who basically to promote the vocations to the priesthood and also to help uh, operating basically pedophile ring for the Vatican for now over 50 years because during the academic year, of course, uh, they study. But these altar boys that are serving daily, you know, uh, in the summer, the, this... Uh, priest seminary, transforms itself in a sort uh, of uh, camp, an altar boy camp, full of young kids, a pedophile's dream, right in the walls of the Vatican. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, this uh, is uh, shocking. More shocking was the fact that they actually, at the end of the uh, documentary that they made with all the various interviews uh, that uh, I have linked to an article that I have posted on my website, liusagami.com, uh, at the end of this interview, they actually, the, the journalist, the Italian journalist, um, who I must say did a very good job and a very courageous job, because uh, you know in Italy doing this kind of job is pretty risky. I mean, uh, going right in the, in front of the beast, the Vardigan, is really very powerful. So this Gaetano Pecoraro trying to front the superiors, but he saw that the, he was ostracized. Why? Because uh, these kids who actually denounced this, uh, Alter boys, after they denounced to the superiors what was happening, they all got kicked out. One of them who came from Poland ended up living in the street. 
Hmm. And uh, and basically, instead, the, the guy who was raping them became a priest, and the journalist went to interview him. And he, of course, was defiant in front of the camera, but uh, they pointed out to him, now you are also in charge of an oratory with little boys. Hmm. And this was one of the guys who apparently he raped something like four boys within that uh, that uh, those few years in which this uh, witness... Uh, are speaking about these events, which of course are shocking because they come right from inside the Vatican walls. So I think that we have uh, said enough. I uh, said enough from my side. I would like your comments after all this because I'm sure you are quite shocked yourself. Yeah, you know what I, I wanted to mention, Leo, was that even though maybe Pope Francis wasn't implicated himself, being that it happened near his home. <laughs> He has to know about it and really sanction it as okay, right? Well, you see, that's another interesting thing. The Italian journalist, the provocatory, went to the superior who actually was, uh, uh, where, you know, these altar boys at one point denounced the whole thing to their super, to the superior, the spiritual father they had. He was quickly removed by the Vatican, but by the journalist found him and started to ask him, you know, what is the deal with this situation? Why you were removed and why the Pope didn't do anything about it? And he was really uh, put in difficulty in front of the cameras. And he said, no, I'm not discussing anything, no, I'm not discussing anything. But at one point he said one thing that really made the journalist really turn a little bit saying, wow, he said a big thing here. At one point he said, please help these children. Hmm. So at one point he actually admitted that these children were victims. And, uh, the, I mean, the, the actual witnesses, these uh, altar boys, their accounts uh, of uh, oral sex, of uh, perversions going on uh, uh, within the Vatican walls, both in the pre-seminary of St. Pius X and within, actually, the Basilica of St. Peter's, and even during the Mass, uh, at one point, uh, there is uh, this seminary, this, uh, this um, rapist, basically, who is dressed up, you know, like a priest and everything, and he's calling this altar boy behind the altar where the, the Pope is celebrating Mass, and he took out his, uh, his penis in his hands, and he was stroking it, and said to the altar boy, please come here, please, please. <laughs> well, I mean, what else could... Uh, <laughs> nothing, yeah, yeah, like I said, nothing surprises me, but I'm sure it surprises a lot of our listeners because... We don't hear a word about this here in the American news. How did the Italian press cover this? They covered it. I must say there was a big response in the last few days from all the Italian media, but there was also a similar response from Avenire, which you know is the official newspaper of the Vatican and uh, uh, of the Episcopal Italian bishops, uh, that of course uh, immediately started to the Vatican is not admitting uh, that they are finding themselves in real difficulty in front of this uh, situation. Because, you see, they, this, even this priest, uh, who is now a priest, who is one of these rapists in, within the Vatican walls, uh, he is, uh, of course, saying no, no, no. But the, one of the altar boys showed the messages that this guy still sent to him only a couple of years ago. So right. Telling him, uh, you know, like really messages that were pretty, pretty much like, uh, please, well, why answer me, answer me, I need you, come here in the Vatican, and I want to have sex with you, please, uh, my dick is hard, and all these kind of right. things. So, you understand? This right. is a scandal of immense proportions, and so, of course, I have the impression, and, and this is really strange, Greg, because the scandal has been around now for at least a week in Italy since the situation has been unveiling uh, in the press after the actual documentary was uh, was uh, broadcast by the Italian TV. And still there is not one single Catholic or non-Catholic or whatever newspaper in the English language that is touching this subject. This is really weird because there is a lot of, uh, um, of media outlets out there that now seem to cover the Vatican scandals. Exactly. To, so yeah. it's, it's, it's like it's being ostracized. It's like 
So, I, so just to be clear, though, the big newspapers like uh, La Repubblica are covering in this. Corriere della Sera, actually, one of the main journalists from Corriere della Sera. You know how important Corriere della Sera is in Italy because right. it's the, one of the main Italian newspapers. He was consa- uh, he was actually shown the video before everybody else just to have an opinion, and he gave his opinion on camera before the show went on, and he said. This is absolutely shocking. I will send you the the link to when he says it, and he was absolutely said, "Wow!" Yeah, send me that. What's the Vatican's re- official response? The Vatican, of course, uh, denial, denial, denial. I mean, <laughs> what? what uh, <laughs> the, the, I mean, denial, which is really sad, also because uh, you, you can't really deny things that are. Uh, that, uh, like this, this, this whole thing. Of course, now I'm watching the latest news that is coming out three hours ago from the Vatican Avenire. So this is something that is just coming out from the Vatican. You ask me, and this is coming on real time <laughs> to you. Okay. It's coming from the press agency of the Vatican. Just a few, a few. Uh, I think it was issued just a few minutes ago. In consideration, this is what they're saying, eh? In consideration of these new elements that have emerged, it's uh, an, an indagine, a new indagine, a new uh, spec, uh, investigation is taking light to what has really happened. Uh, we have to uh, this uh, episode that sees uh, an ex-seminarist uh, from, uh, this is one of the witnesses, of course, they're talking about, uh, and then they're talking about also the guy who actually became priest. The one that they went to interview that uh, you remember I was telling you about, the guy who raped uh, some of his younger seminarists and then went on to become a priest. Well, basically, they say that they had already some news about it from 2013 and some investigations had been made. But of course, they did nothing. I mean, I'm reading what they're writing here, Greg, and they're really trying to to get out of it in some way, because it's, this is like big news. I mean, <laughs> that the, the, the Pope and the, uh, the official newspaper of the Vatican is coming now out uh, to defend themselves in this way. I mean, you, you are a journalist. You know what, what this means. I mean... Yeah, and they have, it, they, they have the altar boys on record, correct? Yes, they have the altar boys uh, actually on record. There is an interview. The interview has been... Uh, um, I also posted it on my website with the uh, the only at the moment English article about this. But I guess that in the next few days you're gonna have it all over the mainstream news, and you had it here first, of course. But uh, yeah, you know what? Say- Let you sent me that article, so I'm gonna put it up on my website too. Absolutely. And let me tell you that here they say the Vatican saying no presunto scandalo. Sala stampa Greg Burke. I, uh, as you know, is a cardinal and a uh, uh, very important ca- cardinal. He, um, he said, falsità sui chirichetti in Vaticano. Il Papa non ha mai ricevuto presunta vita. Okay, Cardinal Burke is trying to defend the Pope saying that he didn't know anything about it. Now, so, I mean, here it's getting really very high up for somebody like Cardinal Burke to have to tweet this on Twitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, actually, no, Cardinal, this is not Cardinal Beck, sorry, this is the spokesman of the Vatican, Greg Beck, who is now a, is a journalist, and uh, he is actually now responsible for La Sala Stampa. Del, uh, he had basically, he has taken over the job that used to be of Padre Lombardi. You remember the Jesuit who used to have right. the... Okay, so now he seems to have taken over. He's an American journalist, born in St. Louis, and uh, so he's basically replying as uh, uh, saying that the, the, the Pope didn't know anything about it uh, and uh, he didn't know about anything. But then this is strange because uh, now already in this article we have two things that don't really fit with each other, Greg. I told you earlier that the Vatican is saying they're starting an investigation, that they knew about it from 2013 and then later on Berk instead says the Pope didn't know anything about it. <laughs> How could he not know anything about it if it's going on 200 feet away from his house? <laughs> yeah, it's completely ridiculous. 
Juventus. I mean, uh, I mean, I just got this uh, this thing uh, from from, from uh, Lavenire. I'm gonna forward it to you now, so yeah. you can have a look at it yourself. And I'm gonna also forward you uh, both the documentary, so you can see it yourself. Uh, and also, I'm gonna uh, forward you uh, the reaction that we were talking about. I mean, it's, it's just it's, it's just extraordinary that. Uh, the Vatican is put in this situation because of their own doing or their own wrongdoing. But we know that it goes much deeper than this, Greg. We know that this is only, the, uh, you know, it's like uh, scratching the surface because we know that it's just like Hollywood. We are just touching, uh, you know, they are just letting some things out, but we know it goes much deeper. And uh, just as in Hollywood, the Vatican has a satanic background involved also in all this. Because... Uh, there's been activities of, of Satanism in the Vatican, and uh, I'm sure that sooner or later some witness will come out also with that information. Well, you At know, the moment, there, are, there is some more information that came out about Emmanuel Orlandi. But, if you want, I can give you that. Uh, you know. Yeah, we, we got about three minutes here. Do you need more yeah. time? Well, no, I mean, uh, yeah, well... Three minutes, uh, we can yeah, definitely give this information because, uh, uh, you know, Emanuele Orlandi was that girl who disappeared uh, in the early 80s. Uh, it was a big news. You were in Italy at that time, right. I think, when she disappeared, no? Mm -hmm. It was a very important thing because then she never reappeared in any way or form. And the family has been searching for her ever since, especially her brother, who I know personally, which is called Pietro Orlandi. Now, the information that comes out lately is that the Vatican knows about where Emmanuel Orlandi is buried, but doesn't want to reveal it, because this whole thing is connected, like I also, I mean, I spoke in an interview two times, Pietro Orlandi, and we spent a lot of time together, but there is a big suspicion that uh, Marcinkus was involved in this whole thing and that uh, there was also the involvement of some Satanists, a guy called Efrem del Gatto. There's the possibility that uh, basically they were doing a satanic mass in the Vatican using cocaine with this uh, virgin on the altar, which was Manuel Orlandi, and uh, that she died because of a cocaine-induced uh, situation. This is one of the possibilities that uh, yeah, I rem there is food. Yeah, I remember this story when I was there. And uh, I remember, now that I think about it, uh, I wouldn't doubt that Martrinkus was involved in this. What else wasn't he involved in? The killing of Calvi, the bank scandals? Go ahead. Well, of course. You're talking about, I mean, Manuel Orlandi is... Uh, uh, probably there is this involvement with Marcinkus that was also outlined by some witnesses, especially a, a member of the Banda della Maiana that, as you know, was this gang very important in those years in Rome. And yep. uh, that were uh, acting a little bit like the thugs of the Vatican. A bit like, uh, so the dirty work could be done by these people if they had to get uh, journalists murdered the, like they did in the case of Mino Pecorelli who printed the whole list as you remember, in OP, mm. of uh, the lodges in the Vatican with all the members of the Freemasons in the Vatican. Well, that was something that cost him his life. Right, and for our listeners, Mark Trinkis, we're talking about, uh, he's, he's passed away, but he was the head of the Vatican Bank, a bishop from Chicago. And, uh, boy, I do I know stories about him. I covered him a lot. You, and you were actually one of the last people who covered the was supposed to interview him, I remember. Yeah. I mean, but I also remember that you spoke with one of his girlfriends, if I don't... Uh, <laughs> was yeah. that the case, I remember, yeah? Plus his godson, and uh, it was a credible story, and then uh, he turns up uh, passing away in Phoenix, just when the Italian journalists were coming here to reopen or to talk about the Calvi murder. Leo, we got a whole ha another half hour to go, so let's take a break now. I'll be back in three minutes with Leo Zagami from Rome. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The following, the following program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off-limits limits by the, by the Supreme, Supreme Jesuit, Jesuit command. command, but stand tall, people. people. Listen, Listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal, and uh, my guest today is uh, Leo Zagami, and he, Leo's in Rome. We've been talking for years regarding the Vatican and all of these things that we're talking about today. And at the break, me and Leo were saying, uh, isn't it amazing uh, how this is unfolding now right before our very eyes as we were talking about it 10 years ago and uh, 12 years ago. And now what we're seeing is this just being the tip of the iceberg, which we'll get to. But I know, Leo, you want to wrap up some things about the story about that missing girl from 1983. Go ahead. Oh, well, yes, another document that has just surfaced, uh, um, always pointed out by one of these journalists who's doing extremely good work. I mean, just like me, there's investigative journalists who do their jobs, other who, as you know, just stay silent. But if you are in Rome and you really dig deep, you can find the worst scandals. But nowadays, things are coming out that are incredible. 
this uh, girl, as, as we talked about before the break, uh, disappeared in the early 80s, in 1983, in June 1983, and she never reappeared. She was called Emanuela Orlandi. Now, this document surfaced from 1997, which accounts for half a million uh, dollars spent on this woman, uh, on this girl, that then later, of course, became a woman because uh, she was in her teens, but of course she grew up. Until 1987, by the Vatican, they spent half a million dollars. That means, what does it mean, this? It means that they, of course, uh, kept her alive. <laughs> now, uh, when the story surfaced in the newspapers, the Vatican, of course, always this uh, new spokesman, which I'm not really, I don't really know very well, but he came out immediately and, and denied everything, as usual, and said... Are you there? The Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, he, he said basically that this document was a forgery, the Vatican Press, uh, and the, the responsible for, the spokesman for the Vatican. So we we are always in denial. Anything you bring up, they simply deny it. But uh, it's very hard for the Vatican to continue to deny all this evidence because, of course, now we have seen it just before the break from the latest reactions from uh, also this scandal that probably is gonna. I'm sure it's going to unveil to the Americans as soon as they get off the Hollywood one. And there is a connection, though, between all these scandals. Because, um, you know, let me, let me just bring something up to you, and it might be good for our listeners. Back during that time, I was in Rome as a journalist, and it was just after uh, I was involved in a terrorist attack and almost killed in the newspaper room when the uh, supposed right-wing group, some group... Uh, decided to uh, put a bomb in the American newspaper, which I later found out was probably orchestrated by the CIA. And uh, so people started to know who I, what I was trying to uncover. And I was sitting on Via Veneto, and this girl came up to me. And to make a long story short, she said, I need to talk to somebody. I've, I've been a victim of the, the satanic worshiping down in the Vatican. And she said when she was a young girl, she witnessed the killing along with a number of other children from high-level elite families of a young boy on the altar in the catacombs of the Vatican. Uh, so, I mean, Leo, this stuff does exist, correct? Absolutely. And I've outlined uh, in my books uh, how not only does it exist, but there is also a lot of evidence that corroborates all this. So... We are talking here about the confirmation that comes uh, in the forms of witnesses of uh, people who have suffered themselves the persecution of the Vatican, like myself even, because uh, they are simply not only in denial, but they try to keep the media silent in every possible way. So when uh, me and you started this, uh, I mean, you started even probably before me on this uh, radio show of yours, the Arctic Beacon, no? Right. And, uh, this this uh, starting to investigate the Jesuits, the Vatican, and so on, they immediately, you know, pointed out to, you know, to the establishment, okay, we have Greg Anthony Zizmanski here, then we have Leo Zagami coming in saying these things. And, of course, uh, we have been monitored since then. <laughs> I mean, even, no, no, but it's not a joke. I mean, even today, I even saw visits from the Holy See on my website after my article appearing. And it's it's like, we know very well that the enemy is observing us, uh, like they are observing Alex Jones, like they are observing people who are obviously disrupting their plans. Because, you see, since uh, the Donald J. Trump era, things are really turning our way, not their way. That's why things are unveiling in Hollywood. They will continue to unveil, they have already, but they continue in the Vatican. And even at the higher pace, we had even a scandal, as you know, uh, this summer with the uh, police, Italian police, breaking into the, the Palazzo del Santo Uffizio in the place where they basically decided it's the congregation for the mothers of faith and they were having an orgy with cocaine. <laughs> yes. Orgy. So, yeah. I mean, we, we are in the end time scenario that we had envisioned many, many years ago. And now it's not like uh, they can deny it. But they will continue to deny it because they have the press, the media, unfortunately, still on their side, the mainstream media. So we have to uh, break this uh, silence 
we have to spread this news. For example, regarding the information that I gave to you listeners today about the altar boys in the Vatican being raped, well, people need to know this, uh, this truth, but they also need to know, for example, I've discovered that uh, the, the witches binding rituals against Donald J. Trump were manipulated and orchestrated not by some pagan witch, uh, whatever, but by a Christian Freemason connected to the York Rite and Rosicrucian Christian Society that uh, arose only from Christian Freemasons, and these people are actively working with black magicians to bind Trump magically. And then uh, we, we, we saw also how the, the, they are even manifesting it publicly, doing these rituals in the middle of Hollywood against Trump. So Trump is becoming the enemy because definitely there must be people who are not, I mean, the liberals are brainwashed. And George Soros has just invested 75% of his money so he can continue to brainwash them even after his death. So we are now in, in a situation that is very particular. But here in Italy now, latest news that came in is that ISIS has threatened the Vatican with... Uh, some kind of a photo where they showed the guy with a mask in a car going against the Vatican. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there is uh, this uh, fear that is brought upon the people, no? And also this, uh, let's say, they will probably, if they see that the scandals go so deep and deep and deep and that the Pope will risk basically his place, at that point, I bet an ISIS bomb will explode. <laughs> yeah, and all we I hear that's the case because it reminds it reminds me of what happened in your days when you were a victim of the same technique. So exactly, exactly. And you know, Leo, let's talk about the tip of the iceberg here. We're hearing all this stuff come out in Hollywood now about pedophilia. We're hearing it out of the Vatican at the highest levels, but this is nothing new. What do you think their end game is here? In the game, uh, you see. The arrival of Donald J. Trump has created a big problem the moment in which Hollywood has become the anti-Trump establishment. The moment in which Hollywood has not supported Donald J. Trump to get those that 75% that Ronald Reagan got in his days. Now, the, the, you see the support of Donald J. Trump is only 35% because that missing percentage is coming from the enemies he has, especially in the media in Hollywood. So at that point, you see, when you have a president who is not your friend, well, that president at one point might decide to let a few CIA guys on the loose and try to see if they can get some info on you and bring down the whole, the whole, the whole charade, mm -hmm. which they did, which they did. And I am glad that he did. Because Weinstein was using Mossad agents, was behaving like a crook and a criminal, and everybody knew about it in Hollywood, and nobody did anything. But the, 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 the thing is here, we, I remember still, maybe it was 10 years ago, when I was on your show, and was, I think, maybe the same time of the year, whatever, and I told you, uh, Hillary Clinton has a lover, Uma Aberdeen, and uh, they are perverted and twisted, all this. And now there is news that is surfacing that there might even be a young girl raped by the two. Mm -hmm. and then we saw how Anthony Weiner, the husband of whom happened, behaved with a little girl. Right. Sending the naked pig. I mean, here, the thing is this. Maybe before, Greg, we were against a unified New World, New World Order that was ungrasped. It was impossible to even uh, scratch, the, even, you know, disturb in any way because they had everything. They had the media, the president, uh, in Obama's years, in the Bush years, in the Clinton years. The military industrial complex and the system was completely overwhelmingly powerful and you could do nothing about it. But now you have, a, you have basically a loose cannon in the White House who is starting a sort of revolution. I mean... It might be a compromise along the way because he's the president of the United States. But uh, you see, Hollywood should have never turned back on the president of the United States of America because you can't have Hollywood against the United States of America. 
I mean, Hollywood is the propaganda machine. It was used for years. Mm -hmm. People, during the McCarthy years, what happened in those years? When, right. uh, when they discovered communist, uh, communist, what kind of, uh, I mean, a communist uh, would be arrested in Hollywood. Now, communists are glorified in Hollywood. Right. The same communists who are glorified as Satanists are basically members of the New World Order, dead inside of the Illuminati we have been denouncing for years. There is also, of course, uh, conservative uh, uh, perverts uh, and, and people like, you know, that could well be perverts also on the other side. We're not saying that, uh, that you know, all Democrats are bad, all Republicans are bad. Here we are saying that, uh, of course, uh, there is, uh, we, we have seen even in the, in the Republican Party a great problem because nobody is really sustaining Trump. They are all people from the swamp, and the swamp is very difficult to drain. They're all monsters of the swamp, but it's nearly impossible to drain. But now, we have seen also these scandals that are quite shocking. I mean, even this actress from Smallville uh, involved in a sect, I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, no, go ahead. In, well, I mean, uh, very interesting because she, she was involved with a sect that basically uh, then the, the guy in charge... Uh, he, 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 he marked his own name on all the various people who were part of this, uh, of this uh, sect. She, she was in charge of this sect with this guy. And, and, and basically they had all, have all these followers in the liberal establishment. And this is what happens really in the liberal establishment. I mean, sects and people who are dangerous are let loose and they don't seem to care about condemning them. I mean, actually, they glorify them. For me, Jay-Z, these people who, uh, of course, supported uh, Obama and are, uh, you know, and all that kind of Oprah Winfrey, these people are in bed with the Satanists. Mm -hmm. All the way, with the Illuminati, they, they, they actually uh, use their symbols, they try to, to, uh, to glorify them with their art, uh, and so Hollywood Satanism, ritual murder, and all this that, you know, I mean, Hollywood has a lot more perversion than the ones we are seeing now. Because now we are scratching the surface, but I don't think we will ever get to the bottom. Because, of course, Hollywood has their own security apparatus. <laughs> and, in, and, in the, and it's in the hands of experts of the intelligence field. Even private contractors, of course, that work for each actor. But here we are, have also an apparatus that has to defend Hollywood. But if, uh, like I imagine, the scandals will go on, Hollywood will not exist as such in a few years. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, when people like, for example, Quentin Tarantino and Leonardo DiCaprio are going around not finding, not being able to find the money to finance their new film, this gives you an idea of what Hollywood is becoming. Because now, you have to also understand, Weinstein was a money machine. There was money in it. And that all this money now is not going to be invested any longer. So, and, and there is big interest around this, uh, this whole thing. So, I'm very interested also in seeing what's happening in, in, in Hollywood. Because Hollywood is a place which has a very awkward background. Uh, the first Freemasons who started Hollywood, uh, later on they supported people like Aleister Crowley, their follow the followers of Aleister Crowley, who actually did the first Gnostic Mass with the uh, naked woman on the altar in Hollywood. Uh, not in England, in Hollywood. <laughs> so Hollywood is exploding now with scandals, but Hollywood has a very dark background, even in the days of Shirley Temple. <laughs> yes. Or, yeah. Because, uh, people like uh, Shirley Temple was a little baby actress. I mean, a little girl actress used because they are a bunch of pedophiles and they were, were in a way promoting pedophilia by making acceptable the fact that you had a little girl running around dressed up like a woman. Mm -hmm. And then you had the Lolita, of course, the movie made by Kubrick, and you had, of course, the whole cult of Lolita that is uh, permeating Hollywood. So, this is one part of the thing. Then you have, of course, another side of things, even more sick, because then you have artists like Marina Abramovic, that, as you know, is connected to the Podesta brothers, 
Yeah, talk a little bit about, we forgot about the spirit cooking events that have been going on. <laughs> talk a little bit well, about that. Well, uh, apart from spirit cooking, even before the spirit cooking, in 2011, at the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, annual gala in Los Angeles, full of Hollywood stars, full of Hollywood stars, with Marina Abramovic, but also there was Deborah Harry, there was all the artists, the singers, the, the actors. They, basically, what they did... They um, created a situation whereby you were mining, uh, eating a body. There were these fake bodies, uh, fake uh, heads chopped uh, on the table, and you were eating them. And you were participating in the slaughter of these bodies and enjoying a form of aesthetic cannibalism. Exa exactly, sick. yeah. Com completely sick, completely sick. But this is Hollywood, I mean, it's the land of the sick people. You see, the... We were talking 10 years ago about the Ordo Tempi Orientis. You remember we yes. made very many shows talking about who this, uh, what was this sect, uh, who was Alistair Crowley, the influence of Alistair Crowley. And uh, now Alistair Crowley and the OTO have, been, have become very popular in Hollywood. I mean, already four years ago, they were trying to promote the OTO like the new Scientology in Hollywood. So... And, and we know that Scientology actually came, it was created by a disciple of Alistair Crowley. So, so they're actually going down to their origins now, you see. And uh, back in the days uh, of, uh, of uh, when Hollywood there was still black and white, there was, uh, uh, there was these artists who were actually going to the satanic masses, the Gnostic masses, or Gnostic masses of Alistair Crowley in Winona Boulevard, uh, made by Crowley's uh, disciples, and they became very influential, and they became very influential because they were both influential, both uh, on one side of things, which was, of course, uh, they have always been influential with artists, and on the other side, uh, with influential people, with what will become later on NASA, with the Parsons guy, who uh, was one of the people who gave birth to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and so we find uh, really, in California, all these people, followers of Alistair Crowley in the early stages of what developed to be the New Age phenomenon. Because then all this became the New Age phenomenon, no, Greg? And New Age phenomenon is, is created by the Jesuits. Exactly. I mean, they, I mean, people don't know that because they think New Age it was created by the Theosophical Society. But like I pointed out in one of my books, uh, um, I, I explained this in my trilogy, Confessions of an Illuminati, that the Theosophical Society was taken over by the Jesuits after the death of Madame Blavatsky. And this is not me who says it, but people from the Theosophical Society, even the modern theosophists who have denounced uh, mainstream theosophy, have been completely in the hands of the Jesuits. And they had they created even a secret society back in the days of Alistair Crowley, uh, Greg, called the Universal Brotherhood. And in this Universal Brotherhood, created in the USA by the Jesuits, they uh, enrolled the closest follower of Alistair Crowley. That at one point, even Crowley got pissed off and kicked him out of the OTO because of, uh, he was more loyal to the Jesuits than to him. And he was called Frater Ashad, Charles Starfeld Jones, known as Frater Ashad, Akkad, some call him, call him. But he's very known in the occult world, and he's still, uh, you know, his writings, uh, he has a big following. And, uh, but he actually uh, left at one point, well, he was kicked out of the OTO because the he became the grandmaster of the Universal Brotherhood created by the Jesuits. And, and it was other Illuminati, other members of secret societies that accused uh, this. You can find even on Wikipedia. It says uh, uh, Paul Foster Case, who is a famous Rosicrucian uh, founder of the Builders of the Diatom, accused uh, Frater Ashad of belonging to a secret society based on the Bavarian Illuminati created by the Jesuits. <laughs> So, so, so I, as you see, I mean, we are talking about a situation which always conducts us to the same people behind the scenes, which are the Jesuits. <laughs> I know. Yeah, look at, you know, uh, for my listeners who don't know, Leo's been involved. Uh, he was an insider, really, with the 
with the Freemasons, talking to some of the, and knowing some of the highest level uh, Freemasons in Rome. And uh, Leo then got out of them and was uh, basically, man, you went through hell in uh, Norway, I remember, when they almost, they put you in jail for a while, didn't they? Yes, I was arrested for espionage because, of course, when we started to, to really reveal what we are revealing today, thanks God, after 11 years proving that we were but not only right, but we were right on the spot with everything we said. Uh, when we first said these things, of course, they, they created waves. <laughs> and uh, I was persecuted. I remember. The services arrived. They even came to my door. They threatened, to, uh, they threatened me directly in front of, uh, you know, with witnesses. It was pretty astonishing what happened. I mean, it was shocking for some people to see that they, they didn't really want to have me uh, writing about them, talking about them. They wanted to silence me in every way possible. And I mean, uh, you still have interviews from those days and, and, and you remember exactly what happened. It was shocking. Yeah, and if you want, listeners want to go back, go to my website, uh, greganthonysjournal.wordpress.com and you can get a lot of these interviews uh, that we did years ago. Leo, we're running out of time. we got about a minute and a half, but I did want to tell my listeners I'm going to have you on uh, every other week. So we'll get together again a week from Monday uh, and keep an eye on what's going on in Rome as there is a lot that we don't get here. And I really appreciate it. So do uh, you have any final comments for the American people? I think one thing I want, we got maybe a minute. Uh, all of this stuff t we're talking about, in the background we have North Korea. We have a plague that started, the Black Plague is starting in Africa now, which is an amazing story. Uh, how many people have died in such a short time. They say that it's got a three-hour death cycle. You can die in three hours. Uh, but, Leo, what do you think's in store for us? we got about a minute. What about North Korea? Well, I mean, North Korea is uh, always used as a sideshow, as you know, to keep the strategy of tension going in that area of the world. I think that mostly the game is played between China and the U.S., so whatever China and the U.S. decide, then uh, I think uh, North Korea always has a side shot. If uh, by any chance uh, he really gets uh, serious, well, then uh, it would be a big problem. But I still think he's part of the show, uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un. So I don't think that we have to worry too much. Okay. But if, 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 if it ever went out of the show, there will be... I don't think there will be any more shows. <laughs> there will be any more shows. <laughs> no more shows, no more nothing, yeah. Leo, we're all out of time. I want to thank you again. We'll get to yes, Leo. So I, I would like people to go and check my new book, uh, which is called uh, The Decline of the Western Initiatic System and the Rise of Satanism in Our Society, which you can find on Amazon. All right, we got to go. Thanks, Leo. See you next in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. The book of Revelation says... The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. So you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The prophecy. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it. It has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.